Okay, are we ready or? Do we have Jack? I don't see Jack here. Unless he's one of the phone numbers. Unless number. he's the phone number. James. This is Minnow. Jack. Oh, there's Jack. Okay. Full house. That's not Jack. Oh. Okay, are we ready to go? Good. I'm, I'm liking this. My face isn't coming up. Okay, Kathy, I think we're ready when you are. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, we'd like to call our meeting to order. Uh, James or Aaron, whoever, um, take the roll, please. Sure, I'll go ahead. Kathy Conroy? Here. Mary Pavlik? Here. John Normile? He's here, but he's not answering. John? John you're on mute. I'm here. Katie McLaren? Here. And Jack McCann? Okay, it appears that we're missing Jack. He was Sorry, here a minute ago. Jack, are you there? He was here a minute ago. All right, well, anyway, we have four. We have four members. So the first thing we have to do is confirm the votes that we took from our July meeting. And Andy has agreed to read the motion. Um, in the first case, the applicant is seeking a renewed approval extension. PLZB 2019-95, the Community Builders Incorporated seeks area variances for 244 to 246 First Street to construct an 84 unit apartment building with no front and side setbacks, 10 feet required, and 111 parking spaces where 164 are required. So Andy, could you read the motion, please? Sure, the, the motion on that was to approve the extension. It was made by Katie and it was seconded by Gary. Okay, and on the motion, uh, John Normile? I voted no. Katie McLaren? I voted yes. Gary Pavlik? I voted yes. And Kathy Conroy? I voted yes. Uh, and I believe Jack was not here. Am I right? He had cut out of the meeting and then... He had cut out. So anyway, yeah. we, we don't have his vote. So on to the next case. James, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Applicant is seeking a renewed approval extension ZB 2018-01, United Armenian Calvary Congregational Church requests a use variance as well as area variances for a lot area deficiency and excessive density related to a proposal to convert a church into eight apartments with a combined total of 27 bedrooms and 13 parking spaces at 144 9th Street in an R2 zone. Andy? And th that was a motion to approve the extension. It was made by you, Madam Chair, and it was seconded by Gary Pavlik. Okay, and on the motion, John Norm John I Normile. I voted no. Katie McLaren? I voted no. Gary Pavlik? I voted yes. And Kathy Conroy, I voted yes. And Jack McCann? Jack McCann was a so, yes vote. Pardon me? He was a yes vote last He was month. a yes vote. Yeah. So is that uh, okay? Andy, Andy, because Jack is not present and this is the vote for the record, are we on? We are, need is that, hello, hello. There he is. I'm here. I've been here. Oh, well, can you hear us? 
Yeah, somebody had me on mute. I don't know what happened. All right. Well, anyway, on the vote there, Jack, for the um, Armenian Congregational Church on 9th Street last month, what was your vote? My vote was yes. Okay. All right. Next case, the Administrative Appeal. St. Joseph's Church is seeking to appeal a fee amount from the Building Permits Department. Andy? Um the zoning board determined in your discussions that it was not a matter that over which they have jurisdiction. There was a motion made to dismiss by Jack and it was seconded by John. Okay. And on the motion, Katie McLaren. I voted yes. Uh, John Normile. I voted yes. Gary Pavlik. Yeah, I believe I voted yes. Jack McCann. I believe I voted no. According to the minutes, you voted yes, Jack. You voted yes, yes. Okay. I wasn't sure because I did put the motion to dismiss. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, and I also voted yes to dismiss. Next case, PLZB 2020-22. Emily Flanagan seeks an area variance for 222 Second Street for a parking deficiency, zero parking spaces proposed, three required. Andy? There was two motions on this. The first one was seeker to declare it a type two action made by Katie, seconded by John. And on the motion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Carried. And, and on the, the motion on the application. There was a motion to approve made by Katie, seconded by John. And on the motion, um, Gary Pavlik. Yes. Jack McCann. Yes. Katie McLaren. Yes. John Normile. Yes. And Kathy Conroy. Yes. And the last one was PLZB 2020-23. Mal Gorzada Rakowski seeks an area variance for 822 River Street for a parking deficiency. Zero parking spaces proposed, up to 10 required. A there Andy? Was, there was a motion, to, a secret motion to declare type two by Katie, seconded by John. And on the motion, Gary Pavlik? Yes. Jack McCann? Yes. John Normile? Yes. Katie Sp uh, McLaren? Yes. And Kathy Conroy? Yes. Then there was a motion to approve made by John, seconded by Jack. Okay, and on the motion, uh, Gary Pavlik? Yes. Jack McCann? Yes. Katie McLaren? Yes. John Normile? Yes. And Kathy Conroy? Yes. Okay, so that takes care of the old business. And now we're moving on to the new business. The first case is PLZBA 2020 386 First Street, a special use permit for the James Conley Social Club Incorporated seeks an special use permit for a membership club in an R4 zone. Is the applicant present? Yes. Okay, could you uh, state your name please and explain what it is you want to do? Sure, so I'm Jen Baumstein. I live on Pinewoods Avenue, I own a home in Troy. And we are looking to convert, well, use the, nat the space that is now Nature's Pub to be a social club, which is a gathering space for folks, and uh, much, like, much like an Elks Club. Okay, and could you explain to us how this may impact the neighborhood? Well, we're, I mean, we're hoping that it'll help it. it. Pardon? Uh, what do you plan to do with it? I seem to have read that you want, we're going to like do things with uh, um, gardening and libraries and stuff like that. It doesn't sound like something in the middle of the night, but when you get in with all of that, do you intend to celebrate or? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, we, in the middle we, of the night. we do know that we're in the, we're in a neighborhood and we've already met with the Osgood Neighborhood Association and have started to build a relationship with them. Um, no, we are not planning on having uh, parties throughout the night. Okay. Uh, we, are, we are trying to be a gathering space. I would say it's, it's almost, it's less use than a bar really because our, our primary use is to be a gathering space and not necessarily be a bar, but of course social clubs do have bars at them. Um, my colleagues, 
Dan and uh, Colin are both on the call as well. I don't know if they want to add anything. Uh, yeah, i like to add that, you know, uh, when we were- oh, Could you just introduce yourself first, please, for the record? Absolutely. Uh, so I guess if we're doing formalities, uh, I'm Dr. Dan Lyles, Professor of Engineering. Oh, at the I'll RPA. sit up straight, huh? Uh, as well as uh, I live uh, on Third Avenue. I also own a business in town. Uh, I am the owner of Collective Effort LLC uh, down here around the corner from City Hall. Um, so that's, I really want to speak to this sort of thing. Like, you know, um, the goal is to have a place where people can regularly meet together. But even in our original kind of like house rules, uh, we make explicit that there will be no standing or like hanging out inside, out in front of the bar. Um, because we really don't want it to be a kind of like uh, um, nuisance to the neighbor uh, or something that might like annoy people. Um, we really are interested in being good neighbors uh, and we've really tried to like emphasize that uh, at, from the beginning of our planning. Okay. Colin, did you have something you wanted to say? Introduce yourself, please. Sure. My name is Colin Donnarumma. I'm a member of the organizing committee for James Conley Social Club as well. The only thing I'll add is that we're incorporated um, under New York State not-for-profit law under section 402. Um, I think the primary purpose for which we see the club being used is as a, a, a social gathering place, but one that's devoted to education where we look at, we're planning to have regular lectures, um, film screenings, and um, social events that um, uh, explore and generate the, the political and intellectual development of our membership. Okay, now are, is this group buying this um, property? Or I, I'm just curious how that works. We are, we're currently under contract to purchase the property. Okay, and you're just a group of people who together are gonna purchase the property? No, it's gonna be uh, purchased under the entity that is James Conley Social Club. It's incorporated as a New York State not-for-profit. So it'll be the not-for-profit that is purchasing and holding title to the building. Oh, I see, okay. Does anybody else on the board have any questions for any of these three people? Uh, yeah, uh, Kathy? Yep, sure, Gary. Yes, Colin, is this a is educational not-for-profit for the New York State? Is that what you're under? So we're, we're under the generic 402 section of New York State not-for-profit law, and we're filing for federal tax exempt status with the yeah. IRS under 501c7 for social clubs. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Madam Chair, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I heard the uh, word bar in there. Will there be alcohol served at the social club? Jen? You're the spokesperson, do you want to answer that? Uh, I'm happy to. So that's the kind of a given in, in most social clubs that there is a bar, but it is not the primary operation. The only people who can have use of the bar are members. Um, when we have public events, because again, we are being, we are incorporated, we will be incorporated under 501c7 law. No public uh, folks will be allowed to have drinks there. Um, this is a something that we take very seriously because we, again, we both respect our neighbors and also want to adhere to the law. Um, but it it is a it currently is a bar, and we will continue to use it as a bar, which is part of our operation. So alcohol will be served. So we're we're in the process of applying for a club beer license. Um, so we're applying for a limited liquor license to be able to serve beer and cider to club members and guests. Um, that would not include any liquor or wine, and it would not be a general bar liquor license. It'd be a, a club beer license, which is a right. limited the, sub. The social club uh, license, I believe, is only good for one year, is it not? Yes, we were applying annually for the, for the liquor, for the license. Right, okay, thank you. Katie, did you have a question? No, I did not. Oh, okay, because you're uh, square lit up there for a minute. Uh, does anybody else have a question for the applicant? Is there anybody here to speak in favor of this proposal other than the two people who did, Dr. Jen? Anybody to speak in opposition? And I gather we don't have any um, 
written opposition, James, correct? That's correct. There's no written opposition to this. Okay. All right. So do we, do we need to go any further or are we ready to vote? Um, Members of the board? I just, I just had a, um, I, I actually did just think of a question. Okay. Sorry. Um, do you have set hours of operation or you're just kind of working with the neighborhood to, um, you know, keep things relatively um, quiet? You don't, do you have set hours that the club will be open or does the nature of it not really lend itself to that? So um, I would love to answer this question. Uh, I currently chair the membership committee. Um, and so one thing we're talking about is that in the initial period like now, what we'll probably do is have um, events that uh, try to keep them pretty, uh, for example, the James Connolly Forum, which is kind of our, a good example of the kind of event we would put on. Um, we try to be out of there by like 9.30ish, um, but that's not a regular event. That's like a one-off. In terms of okay. hours, we're working with our membership right now to figure out what we'd like to do. Um, but we've okay. so far moved closer towards there being more uh, day and early evening hours uh, and fewer kind of evening hours. So we're, again, we're still exploring that. But for now, it'll just be announced event and uh, thing, uh, thing we're doing. Okay. okay. Thank you. And of course, for now, we're not. We're, we're we're still in this wild time, so we're not we're not doing anything. <laughs> True. Oh, you're right. Good point. John, did you have a question? Yes. Would the club be open and accessible outside of a planned event for, for members and their guests? Um. So eventually, that's kind of what we're aiming for. Um. Right now, I would say no, and probably for the next six months or so, we're probably not going to be open that regular. Um, but the goal is to eventually have standing day hours um, with an emphasis on sort of like midday, like I said, morning uh, um, times. Okay, John, anything else? Where have you held events up to this point? Um, to this point, what we've typically done is um, met at each other's homes. Uh, the very first kind of what me and one of the other members to think it is the very first James Connolly event. Uh, we used to kind of meet uh, in bars on St. Patrick's Day and read the work of James Connolly together. Um, and so we've tried to gather different groups of people together um, in so much as we can. Um, There's a number of times we met at uh, the Ale House. Um, and now in order to have sort of like uh, larger events and more standing events, that's why we're kind of seeking space at the moment. Those are my only questions. Okay. Any other questions from the board? If not, do we have a motion? Um, you need a speaker? I, let me see here. Yes, we have a speaker. Yes. Um, Madam Chair, I move that in PLZBA 2020, um, 0034. No, too many zeros. Yeah, <laughs> that the board find this proposal to be its type two action with sufficient information available upon which to make a determination that the project is not expected to cause significant environmental impact. Do we have a second? I'll second it. John, okay, Jack, and on the motion, all in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? Carried. Okay, do we have a motion on the application? Um, Madam Chair, I will move to approve the special use permit um, based on the fact that the proposed po project will not cause substantial injury to the value of surrounding property values um, because it was formerly a bar um, and it sounds as if this project is going to cause less of an impact um, to the neighborhood. Um, 
and I don't believe it's going to impair the public health, safety, convenience, aesthetic quality, or environmental quality of surrounding neighborhood uh, for the same reason. Okay, do we have a second on that motion? John Normile second. seconds. Okay, and on the motion, Jack McCann? I vote yes. Gary Pavlik? Yes. John Normile? Vote yes. Katie McLaren? Yes. And Kathy Conroy, I also vote yes. Okay, so good luck. You're good to go. Thank you very, Thank you much. very much. You're welcome. Next case, PLZB 2020-0035, uh, 10 Kinney Street, a use variance. Lauren Groff seeks a use variance for an accessory dwelling unit in an R1 zone. The applicant oh. present? Yes. Madam Chair, before you start, could I just, um, just really quickly, I just want to say out front um, that I, and Mr. Goff might not even know it, but I am acquainted with his wife, um, taught at School 14, where, um, with his two older girls. Um, so I just wanted to put that out front. I don't think it affects my objectivity at all, but I just did want to disclose that before we started. Okay. Thank you. We all said Andy, she's all right, right? Yes, she, she's good. As long as okay. she can be objective, she's fine. We've discussed this earlier. Okay, great. Okay, you don't look like Lauren, but Mr. Groff, perhaps yeah. uh, you'd like uh, to introduce my parents. <laughs> oh, you are Lauren. Oh, neat. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Lauren Groff, yes, uh, owner with my wife of uh, 10 Kennedy Street. You want to tell us what you want to do, please? Sure. Uh, so there is a second uh, building on the property. Um, we have a generous five acres here in an R1 zone, um, but there is a, a basically raw space above the carriage house, which my parents would like to move into. So basically an in-law type apartment, um, 800 square feet or so, uh, being at number one, obviously legally we're only allowed one dwelling in. We'd like to enable them to be able to finish that space. Uh, and then, um, and then move in. So now you, the carriage house is right now you use the first floor as a garage, correct? Uh, it's technically the, the, the first floor, yeah, because there is a basement uh, floor as well um, down the hill. Pardon me? There's what? Uh, it's technically three stories. There's a back entrance because of the hill and slope. Oh, but okay. It would be the oh. top floor would become the uh, a dwelling unit. Okay. And so the problem is that we don't have um, extra dwelling units in an R1 zone. That is the need for the variance, yeah. Right, okay. Does anybody have any questions for the applicant? I think that um, in reading over your proposal, in my opinion, um, it sounds like a, a good use of the second floor of the detached carriage house. On the other hand, um, we don't want to make it so that other people can put um, second dwellings on their uh, property, which maybe is as extensive as yours in terms of the acreage. You know what I mean? So we kind of have to be very careful there was a question about whether or not you should subdivide and make it a second um, a, a, a second piece of property. That was a suggestion that perhaps was out there. On the other hand, I don't know how anybody feels about, um, like, I, like I say, the, the carriage house is there and you wanna do something positive for the carriage house and most importantly your parents yeah. as opposed to deciding that you want to build your parents a smaller house in the back of your property right am i making myself clear to the rest of the board do you understand what i'm saying it's that's basically the way i look at it that um you know he's not looking to they're not looking to um increase the number of residences really on their property they already have this building there um, does anybody else have anything they'd like to add about that? 
Uh, Kathy, Aaron here. Can can I ask uh, Andy a question on this proposal? Surely. Uh, Andy, as as being a use variance, is this an unlisted action under Seeker? Correct. It, it, it's an unlisted action under Seeker, and it would be subject to the use variance test that's in, contained in state statute. Okay. So, I, if if I could just, um, I believe on the staff report that the the board got this evening. Um, it was listed as a type two action, but, but yes, this would be unlisted as it's a use variance. Um, right. And uh, I, I, I think that the, uh, um, the comment about a subdivision being able to achieve the, the end goal here um, uh, maybe should be discussed a little bit further, um, kind of going along with what Andy said about the, about the five tests. So what, why do you think it should be discussed further? Because it's a good idea to subdivide or it isn't? Aaron? Well, if you, if you look through the, the five um, tests, I, I believe one of them is that um, the property couldn't yield a reasonable return without the granting of the use variance. However, the, the applicant would be able to achieve the end goal through another means. Um, and Andy, I, I don't know if, if tenant number five, if you would consider the fact, if, if this applicant has in fact purchased the property, if that would be considered um, self-created. And, and uh, under the law, it's very clear, this hardship is completely self-created by the voluntary purchase of the property. Right. Why wouldn't you want to subdivide? Does anybody know what the negatives would be to sub 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 dividing? I mean, the, uh, the the layout of the property doesn't lend to that at all. It's uh, one one parcel. Um, I don't know. Somebody I, to me, I don't. I don't know. I look at the the criteria for the use variance, and yet I see a piece of property where they have a carriage house on it, and they want to do something positive with part of that property. And to me, I don't know. I suppose I can't look at it this way, but. You say the hardship is self-created. I mean, that sounds that that criteria sounds so harsh to me for what these people want to do. If you if if you understand, I mean, it's being very. It, it's not like they want to build. Uh, I don't know whatever on their property. They have they have something that's already there. Am that, that's right? Correct. No. That's correct. Yeah, Kathy, you're you're absolutely correct. It it's not about the structure being there; it's about whether or not it can be used as a as a a, a separate uh, dwelling unit is the issue. Um, the the structure is certainly um, the the owner is certainly entitled to keep that structure as an existing structure on the property. Um, the question this evening is is the use of the property, um, and as Andy said, you know one of the five criteria for a use variance, um, uh, all, all five of which must be met, is, is whether or not it was a self-created hardship. And, and this clearly fits the definition of a self-created hardship. Well, Jack? Well, it, it, since the structure is already there, I guess I'm, I'm missing something here. It appears to me that the owner of the structure just wants to upgrade it and make it better and make an in-law apartment. Um, I don't have a problem with this. Now, if it has to fit all five of the criteria, that's a different matter. I mean, I guess that's something we have to uh, discuss. Uh, can I just ask um, what the fifth criteria is? Mine only has four. 
and I forget what the fifth one is. Sure, sure, sure. The fifth, the, the fifth. Per oh, go ahead, Katie. I was just going to say that the self-created hardship is the fifth one. Okay. All right. Let me just write that down here, because that. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, you know, another, forgot. another, you know, if if you're going through all three of these, you know, it might be worth going through them one by one, and simply discussing, you know, the, you know, making arguments for and against how each one might apply, to to this particular proposal. Um, I don't know if I don't know if that's if that's the custom for for these meetings, Kathy, but. That that might be that might be a useful way to, to well, kind of go out. Well, I think that, I mean, in, in my opinion, I, I know I evidently in Jack's in my mind anyway. This is this is uh, a, a well, I don't want to say it's unusual, but it isn't like lots of times it's very obvious that you know somebody wants to put a use in there that's just not a good use for wherever they're going. But and in, in this particular case, um, is for number three. Um, the essential character, I read where they, you know, the driveway, everything is off the street. Nobody sees anything that's going on back there. Yada, yada. So that's all, you know, that's gone. Um, it's certainly not going to alter the character of the neighborhood. It's a self-created hardship, but, well, self-created, I don't know. Somebody help me out here because I, I really, I, I'm with the applicant on this personally. So if somebody can help me on uh, well, Kathy, I think, I think I think perhaps what what might help the board is to understand that it is possible for the applicant to do exactly what they're seeking, right? So so the idea that this feeling that you guys have that you know it, this should be okay or I wouldn't have a problem with it, you know, at at uh, what are we at? Four, Five point four acres. This parcel can easily be subdivided to create the se second lot. The, the, the lot itself would continue to function exactly the way it does today. The, True. the lines Very would simply point. be drawn on the tax maps. And, and, and in which case, the applicant wouldn't need to come to the ZBA at all. It would be for the right. planning commission to handle through subdivision approval, at which time they would ask themselves the same questions you're asking, which is, you know, does this really affect the neighborhood? I, I'm sure they would come to similar conclusions. Right. As, as, as the board. Now, my question to you, Mr. Groff, is why did you say this is that you could you can't subdivide, or why is it not a good thing to subdivide? I mean, this 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 parcel was sub was two different parcels, but there's a parcel out front where there's no existing property. The last owner got these deeded together, uh, and you know, it, I just don't understand. Uh, maybe I don't understand parceling. But you could, you could, you could subdivide. I have, I have no idea. Pardon me? I, I have no idea. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense to me because if we wanted to build an in-law unit onto this building, we would subdivide to do that. I mean, that's what we're doing. It just happens to be set apart. Right. And I think our biggest issue with it is that it's, um, you know, an additional dwelling unit is not allowed. And if we were to okay this, then we set an awful precedent. And then someone, you know, with a quarter acre lot, want to put an in-law apartment on their garage that's right behind their house. And then we're talking about a completely different situation. Uh -oh. So we just have to be careful. Okay, I thought there were like two families like all along down there across the street. And that was all our I'm sorry, I think you're breaking up a little bit. So what? Oh, I, my understanding was that there, there's two families right across the street that are, and this is all R1 here. Maybe I misunderstood. It's, it's the fact that it's, um, in a, it's an additional, it's not like a two family, you're not putting an addition on your primary home. You're, uh -huh. you're gonna have an additional unit on the property that has a dwelling unit in it. And that's, that's where we have a problem with the, uh, with, you know, the way the law reads, the way the zone reads. Um, I mean, I, I don't have a problem with it either. I guess my question is in order to do the subdivision, is there a financial burden on the applicant in order to do that? 
someone who knows zoning. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I'm sorry. Sorry. I, I mean, I could, I could provide a little bit of color for that if, if the board would like. Sure. Um, in, in terms of the, in, in comparison to the, to the work that needs to go in, um, that's already been done on the site plan, you know, I, I would say it's incidental to the cost of developing the, the carriage house itself to be a living space. Um, if it isn't already, you know, you're, it, I, I don't believe it would be an undue burden on the applicant to, to, to do that. It's, it's going back to the consultant to develop a proposed lot, which it looks like a survey has already been done of the property. And so that's the, the heavier lift is getting the survey done. Yeah, but the, 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 I don't know if the survey would be current enough for a new parcel. But perhaps. Well, so what do we want to do from here? Is there anybody else here to speak in favor of this proposal? Okay. Anybody to speak in opposition? Okay, so what do we want to do? Because we know what we, uh, how we feel, we also know, pardon me? Sorry, does this, does this property even make sense as an R1? Five acre? Like, is that is that my real issue? Well, that that's a whole nother avenue that you as the property owner may consider pursuing, which would be a zone change of the property to yeah, to a zone that allows uh, two families on the same lot. I don't know how close you are to the R2 zone in the area. Um, if you weren't near other R2 zones, then it would be spot zoning, but it is another avenue you can investigate. Would you want to do that before we go any further? And would you then? I mean, my, my parents are, you know, we're, we're hoping we were further along already on this um, based on, you know, the, their time frame and finances. So it's time is of the essence for us. Well, uh, on the other hand, if we suggest it, if the, we're not going to tell you to subdivide, but if you could probably start the subdivision process tomorrow. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know how long it takes, but how long could it take you're subdividing your own property? It's not like you you want to purchase a piece of property and uh, you have to subdivide it first. But as I say, you could really start the process tomorrow to subdivide if we were to design you this variant. Gotcha. And then, um, you know, how, how long could it take? You know, um, if you have an attorney and move it along, probably would take as long as it would to, and in the meantime, you can probably begin to make your in, um, interior plans for the property mm -hmm. uh, for your parents, gotcha. you know? But, but then also on the other hand, like this isn't comparable to a quarter acre lot asking for two dwelling units. No, you're right. That's where my problem comes in. I mean, uh, that's what I'm saying. You're, you're back from the road. You have five acres. You have this piece of property. It's not like you want to build a secondary apartment onto uh, uh, empty land. <laughs> you already have the property. The and I agree. And I didn't mean to suggest. No, no, I, no, you're right. But Katie, you're right too. Once we vote, once we do that, once we do that, who's to say, you know, this guy's five acres isn't somebody else's quarter acre? I mean, we can't make that subjective claim either, right? We said you can, in an R1, you can subdivide and put your parents over the garage. It's basically what we're saying. What about, what about, in, instead of denying it, what if we were to table it to give you time to kind of, look at what the options are. Katie, this is Andy. That, that was going to be my suggestion. Um, what the applicant may want to consider is asking that it be tabled, investigate the two other options that were put forth, and if neither one of them is what, something he wants to pursue, be prepared to come back at next month's meeting and address each and every element of the use variance test. Because what I'm hearing is that the board doesn't necessarily oppose the application, but the board may be constrained to deny it because the application itself doesn't meet the individual elements of the test. So that gives the applicant time 
to familiarize himself with what is necessary to, to obtain a use variance under the use variance test. And if that's the route that they choose to go, he's prepared to better address it for the board's satisfaction next. Right. The only problem with I, that I, is, I don't know how much of the time is of your essence, because now you're putting it up a month. I don't know how you feel I, about that. I mean, it's, it's I would also idea, suggest, but, I would also suggest that if the applicant, if this is going to be tabled, that um, a seeker form be prepared and submitted if, if the plan is to come in front of the ZBA, um, because the ZBA will need that form in order to perform their, their seeker review. So what do you want to do, Mr. Groff? Do you want us to vote? What was what was that last part for from Aaron? Did you want did you want us to take the vote now based upon um, these uh, findings of fact? We all know that you're pro it's probably going to be denied. Or do you want you want to go and then you can go ahead with your subdivision, or do you want to table it and come back next month having explored your other options? And the other thing is that if you look into something and there is, you know, it's feasible to subdivide or to, you know, argue your zone, then you can withdraw the application from the zoning board and there's no, you know, you could get started on those other things right away if you decide oh, that they point. are more feasible. Uh, right. But I, was it what Aaron said that you didn't hear about the seeker review? Is I it if you do need to come back here? Just to clarify, I do have the short form from, from the applicant. Already, oh, you do? Already. Okay. All right, so uh, then should we vote to table? And then go ahead and as Katie said, if over the next month or whenever you decide that the subdivision is the way to go, then you just pull the tape, you pull your case and move ahead with your subdivision. Uh, I'll take a table. Okay. So do we have a motion to table? I'll make that motion, Madam Chair. Okay. Jack makes a motion to table. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. And on the motion, John Normile? I vote in favor. Katie McLaren? Also in favor. Gary Pavlik? In favor of tabling. Jack McCann? In favor of tabling. And Kathy Conroy, also in favor of tabling. Okay, so if you have any questions about your process from here, I, I would suggest you check with James tomorrow, James, or whenever. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I can guide them through the process um, for the subdivision or, or for coming back to the ZBA. Yeah. I right, appreciate it. That's what I would do. Good luck. Good luck, Lauren. Okay, the next two cases. So, Kathy, if you don't mind, yes. I, I'm just gonna, I, I'm just recusing myself um, as staff here. I have a conflict or potential conflict. Um, the next couple of cases are in my neighborhood, so I, I won't be on the call for the remainder. Okay. All right, have a good night. Thank you, you too. Thanks, James. Okay, and so now it's up to you, Aaron, correct? <laughs> Yes, yeah, so I guess I'm in okay. the hot seat. Thanks, Kathy. Right. <laughs> so we have an administrative approval appeal. Um, should we take each one separately, Andy, or Andy is advising us on this, or can we take them together? Um, Andy? I, I believe you can take them together um, as long as the applicant addresses the elements of both. Um, they're similar, but they are separate properties. Right. Um, I, I would also state for the record that um, I, I reviewed the documentation provided in this matter. And um, as it stands right now, everything that I have reviewed, I believe the board lacks subject matter jurisdiction to decide these appeals. Um, so I would urge the applicant in his presentation to focus on uh, why he believes that the Zoning Board of Appeals has jurisdiction to hear these appeals um, of the building inspector who has apparently been interpreting state law to, to, to refuse to accept the building plans, and it has nothing to do with the zoning code. Uh, if I may speak, I am- okay. Excuse me, not yet. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, we have to, we're, we're hearing the cases of the administrative appeal of 459 Madison Street and the administrative <laughs> appeal of 456 Madison Street. Um, and Rafael Varela, 
seeks to appeal the decision on each piece of property made by the acting director of code enforcement. Okay, now Mr. Borrello, if you would please uh, introduce yourself for the record and tell us why you think the zoning board should have jurisdiction in this matter, regardless of what it is that you're, the specifics of your case. Thank you, you for your, thank you for your time. My name is Rafael Varela. Um, I am a, I have a master's in architecture from RPI. I am the owner of Building Green Solutions, a construction company and consulting company on energy matters in, based in the city of Troy. And the reason I am filing this appeal is because of the law in the Troy City Code, Article 141-16-B, that specifically states that when there is a denial of, the, of a permit by the Troy Code Enforcement Department, it has to be appealed to the Zoning Board of Appeals. I can read, I can read the article if you give me a moment. Well, no, that's okay. Before you do that, my question to you would be, um, if I could ask it, is why did they deny your um, your uh, application? Uh, why did the so, zoning or the code enforcement deny it? So um, they deny both permits because I don't, don't I don't have a license stamp as a professional designer, but Article. 141-5-F of the Troy City Code. It says that when the repair of the property is under 1,500 square feet, I can um, sign the drawings as a professional designer without having a stamp, as long as it is under 1,500 square feet. Additionally, I would like to say that for the property at 459, I do have submitted the drawings again stamped by a, an a stru a structural engineer uh, registered with the with the with the state of New York. Um, one was sent in August second, I believe, uh, and the other one, uh, an additional section with more details, was sent this morning, first thing in the morning, I believe, eight a.m and uh, I have not heard back from them. So at this point, one of the properties only has the drawings that I have submitted without, without the stamp, and the other one has the stamp. All right, uh, so the one at 459 Madison Street has the stamp. Yes. Okay, but, but you submitted it this morning. Uh, I, submitted, I submitted one on August 3rd, Okay. And they, uh, they say they had additional comments. I mail, emailed code twice, asking them for the additional comments. They never responded. So we just went ahead and in order to clarify, in order to, to show that we are trying to be part of the process, we sent an additional section drawing with more specific details that are pretty standard of uh, two by six construction. This is a pretty a standard repair on, on a building. And this was this morning you sent it? The second drawing was sent this morning at 8 a.m. The first one was sent on August 3rd. On August 3rd, okay. So wouldn't it make sense that we would have to wait and see what if the building um, department has approved or accepted, shall I say, your uh, revised drawings before we can decide whether or not, I mean, I can't say, if the last word from them is that you didn't, you know, you didn't have what you needed. Um, and second of all, it's, it's not within our jurisdiction, but let me just ask you another question. Are you intending to, or why did you not submit the proper paperwork for 456? If you put it in for 459, did you just not get to it yet? Or you're not going to put it in for that? Well, I do, I do would like this board that has jurisdiction over this matter. It does have the jurisdiction according to the uh, Troy Building Code. The Troy Building Code is online. It can be read by anyone. And it clearly states that this is the process I have to follow. And it clearly states that under 1,500 square feet, which is the case of the repair at um, the garage at 456 Madison Street, I can submit the drawings without a stamp. 
And as a professional designer that has spent two years to do a master in architecture at RPI and four years to do a bachelor of science in engineering and industrial design, I do would like to be able to submit drawings without having to have the extra expense and the time to hire an outside consulting company, which- Well, don't we do, if may, if I'm I may sorry. Finish, if I may finish, which we have done for 459 Madison to so we are trying to work with you. 456 is basically a garage, it's a storage garage for, uh, and it's been a, a, a contractor, a storage garage for the last hundred years. So um, I do would like this, this matter to be addressed uh, by this board as I have provided the law, the law of the city of Troy, I specifically ask this board. I know this is unusual because nobody has applied for this before. And I believe the reason for this is that the uh, Troy Code Enforcement Department so far has refused to deny the permits in writing as needed to file an appeal because I have other, uh, other permits that uh, they refused to, to deny in writing for over a year. Uh, so if they don't deny the permit in writing, nobody can file the appeal. So- uh, Okay, can I just interrupt here for a second to say, we did have another appeal um, on a different uh, case, obviously, uh, last month. And I would uh, defer to uh, Andy Brick to, um, explain why the zoning board appeal is not the route that you can possibly go, even if we agreed with you 100% uh, on, your, on your issue. Andy? Sure, uh, and, and I'm familiar with section 141.16 of the code. I'm also familiar with section 285.83 of the zoning chapter, which is your enabling legislation which states that the Zoning Board of Appeals is empowered to hear and decide appeals where it alleged there's an error of law or an error in an order requirement decision or determination made by the director in the enforcement of this chapter, meaning the Zoning Board chapter. Um, this is the same uh, legal analysis I provided to you last month uh, related to St. Joseph's Church, both state law and the Troy City Code, irrespective of the language referenced in chapter 141, um, the Zoning Board of Appeals is only allowed to hear appeals for decisions made related to the zoning chapter. Um, also, uh, the appeal itself is of Chapter 141, an interpretation of 141 by the Building Department, which is not the zoning chapter. And lastly, the denial of the plans because they weren't stamped by a licensed architect or professional engineer is pursuant to New York State statute. That's not even a city code requirement. That's a New York State statute requirement. New York State Education Law Section 7307 requires stamped plans by a licensed architect or professional engineer. And, and that's the basis for the denial, which has nothing to do with the zoning chapter. And as a result, I don't believe this board has jurisdiction to act on um, either of these appeals. May, may I ask? Uh... Who are you representing and what, what's your status with the city? Sure, I, I, I am the attorney for the Zoning Board of Appeals. I, I represent this board. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that being the case, um, does anybody, fr well, I see there's somebody else here on, the, um, on our call, uh, White, Tempe White. Is that a person who wants to speak in favor or against? Or no? May, may I ask? No, not wait, wait a minute. Hold on a second. I want to know who this T. White, if this T. White person wants to speak. Evidently not. Okay, Mr. Varela, what did you want to say? I would, ask to, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Brick, in his opinion, in his argument, what is according to him the appeal process for a denial of a building code permit according to the Troy City Code? Uh, it's, a, it's an excellent question. And, and in my opinion, um, it's set forth pretty clearly in 141, um, an appeal of a determination made under the Uniform Fire Prevention and Building Code is pursuant to state statute. An appeal under 
Section 141, in my opinion, um, would involve a direct challenge through the Article 78 proceeding to the Supreme Court of Rensselaer County. Okay. Well, that, I mean, that's, that's not what it says in 141.16b. In 141.16b clearly states that the avenue is the zoning board of appeals. The, the, what, what it states is if it, a, a determination made under the zoning and building regulations, uh, it's well, not as, as clear as you're implying, and that would be superseded by the enabling legislation in Chapter 285.33, which makes clear these board members can only act on appeals made pursuant to the zoning chapter. Okay, now that being the advice of our attorney, I would uh, ask the other members of the board if you, um, sorry, Mr. Varela, but if you uh, concur with what Andy has told us, if you accept his advice, and that being the case, agree that this we are not the board that Mr. Varela should be addressing uh, in order to get uh, satisfaction on his case. Does anybody wish to? Madam Chair. Yes. I would defer everything uh, to our counsel, who is uh, really the, the most sound advice I've heard so far regarding this matter, that we should take into consideration what our counsel has advised us. We do not have the authority to do this. So that being the case, then the motion would be to dismiss the administrative appeal? Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, do we have a second on that motion for 459 Madison Street? May I, may I speak one more time, please? No, we have, we're in the middle of a motion, sorry. Do we have a second on the motion? Uh, John Normile? Okay, before we vote, Mr. Varela, what would you like to ask? I would like to, to read um, 141. 16. No, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Please, I can't please. have it. I want to make it very clear. No, no I'm sorry. Advice, please, Excuse please, me. Let me speak. Let me speak, please. No, you let me speak, Mr. Varela, because I'm telling you that we are taking the advice of our attorney and we are not interested in hearing 140.1 because this is not our purview. It would be like if you went to. It clearly, it clearly no. Says no. For local sorry. building regulations of the city. No. Local building regulations. It says pertaining to the zoning or local building regulations. Now, we have a motion on the floor to dismiss the administrative appeal on 459 Madison Street based upon the advice of our attorney in that this is not a um, uh, consideration for our board. We are not the board to go to to have this decision appealed. We have a second on the motion by John Normile on the motion, Mr. Pavlik. To oh, we, yes, to dismiss. Uh, Ms. McLaren? Yes. Mr. Normile? Well, yes. Mr. McCann? Yes. And I, Catherine, Catherine Conroy, also vote to dismiss the appeal on 459 Madison Street. The next case is the administrative appeal of 456 Madison Street. And do we have a motion? Um, I also will make the motion on that case that we dismiss this appeal based upon the advice of our attorney in that we are not the board that should hear this appeal. Uh, do we have a second to that motion? Um, and on the motion, Mr. Pavlik? Yes, to dismiss. Ms. McLaren? Yes. Mr. Normile? Oh, yes. Mr. McCann? Yes, to dismiss. And Ms. Conroy, yes, to dismiss. I'm sorry, but our motion is to dismiss and suggest that you take another avenue as was uh, suggested to you when you asked Mr. Breck. And work, we with, have, and, work, and work with our attorney. I think he's willing to help you. I think we believe you said that. Yes. Okay. And do we have a motion to adjourn? I'll make the motion. I'll make that motion. Okay. And Jack seconds the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Vote. Okay, carried. Meeting adjourned. Good night. Thank you. Everybody have a good week and stay safe. You too, Jack. Yes, you all too.